introduction and thanks also for this introduction to give a talk here. Um, so it was planned for last year, but it didn't work out at the end. And now I'm here and today will explain you about Sensif. I had also an introduction. I will jump it through. This is my group, micro, uh, Disposable Microsystems. We are a, um, a junior research group. So, um, and our goal is to create different sensing tools for different applications, starting from point of care diagnostics to variable uh, testing. And so over the last couple of years, we also uh, provided some, uh, some journal covers because I believe this is, this is one way to, um, to share your, your information or your research with the others. And this is some kind of a nice way. And here you can see our latest one in advanced functional materials, where we are showing maybe the variable devices will bring us in the future from, from an hospital environment to where we are living and co continuously measured uh, for a couple of diseases, maybe. Um, but first of all, the question is, OK, we know sensors over decades why we are interested in disposable sensing so what's the what's the trick we have or what's the um, importance behind it so they are these sensors are affordable and single use devices and they are easy to handle so that you could do a short term or middle range measurements or even a single chart measurements to the dexam analyze and in this sense they enable you um, transduce physical, chemical, or biological changes in, in the environment of the sensors to give you an analytical signal. And why they are getting so important, forgetting about the pandemic. Um, so since I was started with this work, it was before the pandemic. Um, so this is maybe, I will repeat this some couple of times during this um, presentation. So because these sensors enables us to, to mine critical analytical information by anyone, anywhere, and at any time without worrying about the contamination and also recalibration. So you can just take it out and measure it. OK, but these sensors you already also know uh, because we are using these, for example, we know them in a single use format to check whether, whether we are pregnant or not. And, and this is, for example, a single use sensor where you can see a yes or no answer. For example, if you want to be, um, if you want to have a more sensitive measurement, for example, in case of the ovulation uh, test, then you need to uh, combine these disposable test strip with a digital reader. Um, so this is to increase the, uh, the sensitivity of your device and also, of course, to increase your revenue. But I will also discuss about that, uh, the strategy behind such, such a sensor model. Because here you have a disposable strip, and here you have the digital reader, which you are not, it's not non-disposable, so you can reuse it for a couple of times. Um, such a sensors are also, doesn't have to be only optical ones, so that we see some uh, optical signal changes. This could be also, electrochemical ones, for example, for glucose monitoring. Here I choose some example, which is a little bit more uh, interesting than a uh, classical glucose monitoring device. Um, and also another one, maybe going to the uh, direction of variables. These sensors could be also some variable patches where you install it like this, um, like the Freestyle Libre for, uh, from Abbott Diabetes, where you can measure the glucose, blood glucose level simultaneously by using such a device. Um, since this is some kind of a little bit non-scientific uh, non talk, so I just want to uh, ask you in this sense a question and answer myself because uh, the question is, why do you believe this company sells it with an, this, a non-disposable reader, although this device could be measured by a smartphone. The idea behind is if you are doing clinical diagnostics and you need to be, in this case, you need to be very accurate. And in that case, of course, you can still 
do the signal readout by the smartphone. But in that case, as a company, you need to assure for all models of a brand, like if you use an iPhone, then you should check these for all iPhone models and also for all companies. And this makes it, of course, uh, a tremendous effort to, to a company uh, to validate all of these devices. In that sense, you can use, uh, you can solve this problem by just uh, bringing an, um, an interface which connects actually these two devices together. Um, here, uh, the detection is in that case electrochemical. And we have here, again, this patch is replaced every two weeks. Um, and, and so this is also and actually the maximum use of a disposable sensor about two weeks um, of the measurement time. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little bit distracted because there was an anti-corona demo outside with some cars and, um, and some sounds. So sorry for that. But the question what we need to ask ourselves is what's the drive about the disposability? And this is, of course, since decades, the most important thing is the economic efficiency. So we would like to have it as cheap as possible, as less material as possible for a single sensor unit. But over the time, now we, there are also some other factors which are um, getting in the, in, the, in the front, like environmental sustainability. So we are now caring about, about the recyclability or even biodegradability or even compostability of our device so that there is no, food, uh, there is no a print of a carbon print or any, any print to this sensor to, the, uh, to our environment. Another thing, as I already said, why disposable sensing is important. So if you are dealing with patient samples, then you need to avoid contamination. And this is very important in the clinical diagnostic. In that case, you are not risking to measure different samples with the same sensor. You just take, measure, throw it away and go with the next sensor. Because in that sense, your, your, the decision based on your result could be crucial and vital for the patient itself. And of course, um, in that sense, we would like to be fast do fast measurements, so we don't want to make any recalibration or time-consuming efforts to, to activate the sensor itself. Um, at the beginning, I talked about a disposable test strip together with a non-disposable part. What's the um, drive behind in that case, it's again, of course, it's a business model which came from razor, razor blades uh, and called these as, as such. And this is credited to the King Camp Gillette, which is also, all, you know, it's a Gillette company's founder. But actually, it's, it's a little bit um, historically, it's interesting because he didn't find or uh, created this business model. He just only used it and he was the most successful people by using this business model. And so it's credited to him. What he invented was actually double edge safety razor in, in 1904. Um, and also his success was uh, also together with, with, the, with the first world war where he got a contract from the US Army, where he provided razor and razor blades. I think the number were 3 million uh, to 30 million. And so the, the thing was the soldiers after the, uh, after the war, they just come back to their uh, country again. And, but during the war, they had these habits uh, using this razor, razor blades. And also um, they, they continued this and also explained that. And, this boomed again. So that was the story how such a business model gets uh, through. In our generation, we know this mainly from the, uh, from the printers and cartridges, where the, print, the cartridges cost almost as the same of the printer itself, because the, um, the company is making the revenues uh, using selling by these cartridges. And this exact same idea is, could be also used for the for the sensor, building sensors. And here we have a single use consumables along with a non-disposable low cost device. And um, here, if you look at the tr uh, translation, a glucose test strip is a razor blade and the glucometer, which we are using is, is the uh, razor itself. So this was the idea behind. And 
this is also something uh, which if you are interested to create sensors then you need to de decide in which way you would like to go either you have a um, complete device which you throw away or you have a device where you use such a uh, business model to create it um, so okay that was the disposable sensors what they are and um, what why they are important so why what we are doing in Freiburg so in my group so today as as all know we are now interested in in diagnosing diagnosing diseases very fast and very accurately and to do so we are also interested not only measuring one single analyte we are interested to detect different analytes at the same time from the same uh, um, sample itself so in in our group uh, we are interested in to detect antibiotics combined with inflammation markers uh, to, to create some kind of a personalized antibiotherapy where you are control um, in your, your body clearance of the antibiotic itself and combination if the inflammation continues, do you need to take these antibiotics further or you need to stop because the inflammation is gone. So that's the idea behind. And what I'm going to speak a little bit more in detail today is the nucleic acid detection using the CRISPR itself. Um, what we are also doing, it's a little bit side way, but it looks sound, sounds like a little bit crazy. But what we are also trying to do is in create a love on a bird system where we are trying to make an immunoassay based hormone detection on freely moving birds. And in that case, of course, we are starting with a chicken. Um, and here the idea is to do a continuous uh, sample uh, taking from um, a drawing uh, from the chicken itself and bring it to the chip to make the uh, immobilization there and then later on the uh, measurement. And this is planned for to do for, for, for one week and every two hours. And we are working together with Max Planck Institute on ontology in Seewiesen to get and also a company of technologies here in Freiburg. Um, so, and this is, for example, if you are ask yourself, the system will be installed in such a code and these codes are really available commercial codes. If you look in the Amazon, so uh, you can really buy such things and, and, and our decision based was also the, uh, the best uh, commands of the Amazon. So that was the, this jacket, which we are using. Um, so another topic which we are also working for is combining uh, light regulation and reversible interaction of proteins in that case of the genetic switches. So all right, you can think of you switch the wavelength of your light and these two proteins can either bind or release themselves. And if you combine these with a protein of interest, this could be an antibody or to realize an assay, which we are also doing. Um, so you can realize by a smartphone such a such a release and binding processes and also uh, make the detection later on. So here we had a master thesis which finished and I hope that we will have a soon some results which we will publish. Um, about that, I don't wanna talk in detail due to the time uh, limit. So I don't wanna keep also that long. So therefore, uh, and the next topic is the paper-based breath sensors. And, and here I'm gonna, at the end of my talk, I will, um, at the last part of my talk, I will go a little bit deeply. Um, today, I would like to show you two technologies which we created in Freiburg, which is also mentioned in last year in Nature Biotechnology as the innovative diagnostic te techniques um, for fighting the COVID pandemic. The first one is a multiplex CRISPR biosensor and the second one is the variable based breath, uh, paper based breath sensors. Okay, we are talking about COVID-19 and that's the thing which uh, uh, which um, which put us since two years at our homes and such uh, caused such a troubles. And the idea behind is we would like to detect it as soon as possible and also uh, as, as accurate as possible. And there are some couple of ways uh, the best way is, of course, to detect its uh, viral RNA, uh, which you could do with a P PCR. I think I don't need to explain this terminology again, because nowadays it's you know, everyone knows about it a little bit at least. 
And also the next thing, the, the so-called antigen test, which you can buy at DM or other stores, uh, these targeting these spike proteins with an antibody and they, they tell you if you're, you have this virus in, um, these are a little bit less sensitive than the viral test. Um, and of course, there are also the IgMs, which shows your body's early response if you have the COVID-19 and, and the IgGs are the late response. So if you are immune against it, so you could also detect these, but these are uh, not, um, not used for the, for the particular detection. Meanwhile, we are uh, actually, we are focusing these two. And if you wanna detect an RNA, you could do a qPCR. And our goal, but in that case, is something else. So we choose to use CRISPR, which is known as a, um, as a, as a, as a genetic schizer. And last year, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentin received the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize with finding, discovering this technology. And here, we are not using it to uh, modify or, or it did something. Our goal is to detect something using uh, these enzymes, which are uh, given by the CRISPR itself. And the idea is for the CRISPR diagnostics, you have two possibilities. One, you could, uh, you could bind such, an, uh, such a Cas9, for example, it's an enzyme uh, which can recognize uh, some uh, DNA. And in that case, for example, you can search for genetic mutations. And last, um, I think two years ago, sorry, two years ago, a group in uh, Kiana Aran's group from Berkeley made the first CRISPR chip where they bound these enzyme to a graphene field effect transistor and they, uh, they, um, they look up for genetic mutations in a whole genome. And if CRISPR finds these uh, mutations, it binds and due to the uh, huge um, structure of the whole genome, they received an electrical signal change which they could, uh, which allow them to detect and say, okay, these genetic mutations is there. Um, but if you would like to be more sensitive, then you can use another opportunity of the CRISPR, which is not only the recognition of its target, but once it recognizes its target, it starts to cleave all RNAs or DNAs, depending on the enzyme that you are looking for uh, using uh, in its on its surrounding. So here, if you forget about the amplification, if you have the target sequence here and the CRISPR-Cas uh, enzyme recognize its target, it starts to cleave all RNAs in its surrounding. And and um, Feng Zhang's group and at MIT and Broad Institute use this technology and had the idea to combine it with a reporter RNA so that they could get uh, these cleavage, uh, cleavage gets them some, some signal difference. And in that case, they introduce a reporter RNA, which is once it cleaves, it gives a signal difference. And so they could, they would enable to measure this, um, the signal change. And in that case, of course, uh, it was a time dependent process. If you leave the enzyme longer then it cuts more. And so you, your signal gets also higher. Um, how we use this technology, okay, before that, maybe why CRISPR is that interesting because it offers not only one enzyme that you could use, this is only the four which is shown here, there are actually also lots of them which are also undiscovered, so there are a huge potential and for example, if you would like to target a double stranded or single stranded DNA, you could use either Cas12 or 14, or if you want to detect RNAs like we do, so you could use Cas13 and even not only for the bacterial systems, but also last year, Jennifer Doudna's group show uh, also an, um, an Cas system, which came up from a bacter bacterial for a uh, page from a virus uh, actually uh, for a bacteria, which could uh, also cleave double stranding and signals in single stranded DNA. How we are using we are using for microRNA sensing that was our target of interest in that case. So we are using Cas13a, which you could program by using a so-called CRISPR RNA. 
And the blue part here is exactly the complementary to your target. So, um, and in, if you put these together, together with a reporter, which we also use, uh, also we use almost the same reporter, which I show you in the previous slide. And later on, we electrochemically modify, uh, we modified it for, for generating an electrochemical signal. But what you need is only these three substances to measure. So you just mix them to the epi, and if you have a, and leave it for a specific time under a specific temperature, which also depends by the enzyme itself. And if you have, for example, a target, no target in your sample, then this complex does not get activated and the reporter is not cleaved. Um, if, and then you could bind these, for example, on a channel like we did channel surface and do an usual assay uh, and binding them to get an, an antibody with an, with an enzyme. And this enzyme could convert, for example, glucose to hydrogen peroxide, which we measure later on electrochemically. It, what happens if we have a target? In that case, the CRISPR-Cas gets activated and also starts cleave all RNAs in its surrounding. You can imagine these like a, uh, like a, like Pac-Man going through this epi and cutting all reporters. And in that case, the biotinylated part still can bind the surface, but the signal generating part is just washed away. And this was actually the whole scheme. And if you, the good thing on this um, system is if you want to change your target, the only thing that you need to change is the blue part of this CRISPR RNA. All other system um, components stays the same. So it's very easy to adapt for new targets. If you are thinking, for example, COVID-19 mutations, in that, uh, in that sense, you only need to um, change your target specific parts, this blue part, and then you have it directly for a next, next target. Um, so, and we brought these on to our electrochemical sensing chip, which is a microfluidic sensor where we have some electrodes and we have a so-called immobilization area where we do the assay. So if you are knowing the uh, technology ELISA, you can think about this. This is one ELISA well, what you, what you are seeing here. And the thing is, we are giving the sample through the inlet. It runs through the channel. Here we have a Teflon um, stabilized um, stopping barrier, which means the, the fluid stops here. And after the incubation, we can suck uh, the, the fluid from, again out from the same inlet, which allows us to work with whole blood, urine, or all types of uh, sample matrices and also prevents any poisoning of our electrodes by the sample itself. And later on, of course, we have the electrochemical detection of hydrogen peroxide at the working electrode, which generates our signal. Um, since I don't wanna go that much in detail in this talk, I just leave the clinical validation part. So we optimize this system and uh, program everything for the microRNA 90B which is a microRNA indicating a microRNA belonging to a microRNA family for medulloblastoma. It's a brain tumor, very aggressive brain tumor. And that was one of these family, uh, microRNA 19B was one family member of this cluster. And we measured these um, our, with our system, serum samples of children, and also uh, check these with the QPCR systems. And um, in, in general, if you look at the ones, so you see a good agreement. Uh, uh, what we have it here, we have a control group of healthy patients. We have a patient one and three, which has an um, operation and recovering from these two more where we accept lower levels of microRNA 19B. And we have a patient uh, two and four, which are in the progressive state of the tumor. And we are really expecting very high levels of microRNA 19B. And our results show in general that, that there is a good match of the standard method, like uh, using our CRISPR powered technology. Only by patient one, we see a difference between, uh, between the biosensor and the QPCR, which we believe that the QPCR uh, probes that we are using was not that um, selective between microRNA 19B and A, 
which uh, these two microRNAs only differs by by one uh, nucleotide. So uh, the uh, the Q PCR could not differentiate these two, and and these microRNA 19A is also a family member of the this brain tumor. So which uh, which says it should be also in the in the serum uh, present. So. Of course, regarding microRNAs, it's important not to measure one. As I said at the beginning, multiplexing. So uh, we did last year and also published this year uh, some different multiplex versions of our sensor. Here you can see actually the sensor, which is so two slides before, in actually in a single channel by adding uh, adding them subsequently. And and here we have a four analytes here. We use some other technology, and and if you are interested, you can look up in this paper. Um, so the idea was to have it four to eight analytes, because this is also something which is, uh, I would say, required for the on-site measurement. So that not only to measure one, but at least four or eight analytes at the same time from the same uh, specimen. Um, now I would like regarding this, I would like to show you a small animation, which we uh, did for this uh, publication. Um, here we have the sample with different microRNAs and falling down to this epi where I said we found the Cas13A with the crRNA complex with the reporter RNA. And of course, if the target is there, so the CRISPR Cas gets activated, so it's shining. And then if you incubate these at 37 degrees, the reporter molecules get cut, of course, you, as you could see. And if you are living longer, it will be more cut. Um, and then uh, what we are doing is taking, taking this in, for example, into a four channel chip where we put uh, different samples, uh, of course, here for the animation, we just use one to save some time and everything binds again. But as you could see, depending on the concentration, uh, some are cleaved, some are not. We incubate them with an antibody having a glucose oxidase, introducing glucose, which gives an H2O2 and oops, um, that was actually the final part. So, uh, so closing all channels so that we have one channels flow. And if you look at our signals now, so um, we are using a technology which is called stop flow protocol, where we leave our, our, um, our um, flow. We are stopping the flow, giving the enzyme to uh, converting glucose into hydrogen peroxide and we flush this uh, to the electrode. And with using this, we showed also the multiplex detection, not only the microRNA 19B, but also the microRNA 20A. So that was uh, the first time using the uh, one cut enzyme to detect these two um, microRNAs. Um, so of course, we, as all the world, we also hit by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and we started to think about to use this technology for the for the COVID-19 text. Uh, te testing and our goal here is to multiplex and again we are we are not using an isothermal amplification so all the measurements which you saw actually they are not basing any amplification technique so it's only it's only electrochemical signaling and also amplification and no uh, DNA or RNA amplification uh, meanwhile, we reduce the time from three hours to uh, to 30 minutes of the whole uh, detection. And for the COVID-19, we actually switched to our initial sensors to have a solid system um, where we targeted the enveloped gene as a first line screening assay uh, and then a confirmatory assay where we are targeting the RNA dependent RNA polymerase gene, which is very specific for SARS-CoV-2. Um, as a negative control, our goal is, is to, to have it the IDIP gene of the SARS-CoV-1. And for, as a positive control, of course, since we developed the microRNA 19B assay at the, from the beginning on, this would be the positive control to see if the test is working. 
And so we are uh, hopefully pro um, showing also uh, very soon some results regarding that. So coming to the breath sensor. So this is something which I really like from my personal point of view because it started very, very differently. And at the time as we are starting, um, there was no pandemic. It was, uh, I think, 2018. And here the idea is to create a low cost and non-invasive and a variable approach for a continuous monitoring and also sampling. So um, here we use a paper. So this is um, a filter paper that we are using, which is used as a substrate for electrodes. So the electrodes are screen printed, um, but also you could use this paper to immobilize biomolecules like enzymes or different types of uh, biomolecules. And another, and actually the most important thing is it's also serving as a solid electrolyte. So um, it's, we are giving salts on that paper and leave it dry. And, and after e each time, if you exhale, you brought 100% humidity to the paper. And after some couple of uh, exhaling steps or exhaling movement, there is enough uh, humidity is there so that you could really do on some kind of a dry paper, uh, some electrochemistry and also measure some stuff. So, um, and to be honest, the whole story was started. We would like to just optimize some a paper sensor, which we created. And at the one step, we just came up to idea what happens if we put it on our mouth and exhale it? Could we still do some electrochemistry? And that was really the case. And another good thing is you are not also exhaling, bringing humidity, but you are also ex you are bringing aerosols, which contains the analytes that you want to detect. And this is at the same time as a sampling method, so that you are not exhaling, but you are also giving some providing some samples every each breath. So, um, but of course, breath is very complex, so it's it's really difficult to measure under this uh, these conditions. So you have in exhaling another temperature than inhaling, and also the the humidity is changing. So th the first thing that you need to do, therefore, we thought, okay, we would like to have an, a sensing electrode which is sensitive to our analyte, but we would like to also have a blank electrode, which is insensitive to analyte, but cover all other environmental and other effects which are coming either from our, of our, our, from our mouth or uh, by, while breathing or from the outside. And that was the idea where we have a sensing and blank electrode um, in the electrochemistry. You need also a reference and counter electrode. I don't want to go in detail. And in that case, here you see such a measurement. Um, I just want to explain it very briefly. So here you have the blank sensors. So although we are providing, we did this um, by simulating um, the breath where we have a, a breathing machine and introduced their hydrogen peroxide. That was our first analyte. And you see all the, here, if we give increase the target concentration, we see a signal on the sensing electrode, but not on the blank electrode. And that was actually the idea also behind. So it's, it's worked well uh, for the um, for the for the exhaled uh, for the for these measurements and showed the proof of principle uh, principle. Um, and but actually the H2O2 concentration, the hydrogen peroxide concentration in your exhaled breath is very low. So therefore, it's really difficult to measure with such a setup in, an, uh, in a real um, exhaling step. So the idea was to go something a little bit also more interesting. And now we are working on a glucose detection a non-invasive breath based glucose detection. And here we bringing glucose oxidase onto that paper. And, and since these are not published, so I'm, I just briefly and uh, the idea is to measure uh, the exhaled glucose, which is coming out with the aerosols uh, on that paper. Um, and 
here I could show you an, an a me measurement. This is not a real measurement, or it's a real measurement, but uh, it's just to show how it should work here. Maybe I, I can't stop. So this is um, this is again the blank electrode itself, and here you see one starts exhaling. Of course, in the exhaling, you are providing every single breathing and 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 analyze concentration, and this is of course at the beginning it takes some time to stabilize you need to breathe breathe breathe, breathe. and um, so but once it's stabilized you see there is a um, stable measurement so the idea is either to measure it continuously or to um, to use it for example just put it out exhale some couple of times or given the time and then put it away and change the sensor with different times um, so, and since at that time, uh, as Nature uh, Biotechnology contacted me regarding the CRISPR powered sensor, I also had this on mind so that this infection is also um, spreading by aerosols and fomites. And that was the idea I explained them also from this technology, which we are developing here. Um, it's something we, uh, we started uh, and waiting actually for the virus specific receptors here we would like to use binding proteins uh, to detect the the, um, the virus proteins on the electrodes by using impedance spectroscopy this is a label free detection method and and hopefully have it by a smartphone based variable system here i just made a quick picture of such a system which would work of course the easiest way would be without a cable or all integrated here. The idea was just to show that something like that could be possible and also would work electrically uh, also using our sensors. So uh, with this, I'm end of my talk. I would like to thank, of course, uh, all of my um, students and especially Richard for these CRISPR work and, and also uh, Elmar and Daniela for the paper-based census work. Um, it's, it's a huge group of people from Imperial College London, where I was also in as a visiting researcher, but also different, um, different groups in Freiburg. So it's a very nice environment. So we have some synthetic biology, uh, like Professor Weber um, in BIOS, but also Professor Schumann in, at Uniclinic. And so that's really a great environment here uh, to work. Uh, my, I have decided for a while to uh, have my latest slide always. I believe science is sharing. It's important to share what we are doing. It's important to reach as much people as possible. And therefore, I, I, my motto is always let's get connected. And you can find me under these uh, social media channels. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions.